Today I am going to talk about Ruby 3 JIT roadmap. Let me introduce myself first. My name is Takashi Kokuben and on the internet I'm working as a Kokuben on GitHub and Twitter and I'm working at, uh, as a backend developer at Treasure Data and I've also been, I've been JIT, uh, JIT compiler maintainer uh, since 2017 and uh, I've been a Ruby committer maintaining that. I also maintain ERB, but um, today's focus is on JIT compiler. Uh, by the way, uh, thank you for these uh, GitHub sponsors. I've been uh, sponsored by these people on GitHub sponsors, and I'm very grateful that I'm, I'm motivated by these sponsors uh, for developing JIT compiler. So today, I'm going to talk about four things. First, uh, what can Ruby JIT do? Second, uh, Ruby 3 JIT's roadmap, and then recent progress in Ruby 3 and current challenges. So first, so what Ruby JIT can do for is a uh, uh, first topic. Uh, for anybody you, uh, for anybody who doesn't know that yet, uh, I'm going to talk about what the uh, current Ruby JIT is architecture. So unlike the normal or other JIT compiler existing uh, in the world. Um, the architecture is like this. So Ruby interpreter has a Ruby thread and with JIT compiler enabled by passing the dash dash JIT option, uh, there is also a JIT compiler thread. And once there's a hot method, like uh, caught uh, 10,000 times or something, um, the hot methods are enqueued to JIT compiler thread and JIT compiler generates a C source code file by compiling a method byte method implementation, which is called bytecode, to a dot c just a C code file, and then JIT thread runs a C compiler as a process, and uh, it compiles C from C file to dot so file, which is a shared object file, and because it's a shared object file, uh, Ruby can dynamically load the native code from dot so file to a Ruby thread and code uh, Ruby thread can call the native code as a method instead of running the or interpreting the method implementation, which is bytecode. So once we have a, a JIT architecture, what we can do with Ruby's JIT is uh, optimizing Ruby methods to native code for hotspots. But, but hot, by hotspots, I mean it compiles only the methods which are called very often. Like uh, the, So if there is a method which is run only once, we don't compile that kind of method. And uh, when we run our application server like Rails, um, we execute the same kind of method very often. And so that kind of method can be considered as hotspots, hot spot, and those are under uh, target of the uh, JIT compilation. And by doing so, uh, we focus on very uh, important methods to be optimized. And because uh, important or hotspot methods are more important than minor methods uh, that contributes to more performance. And there is a reason that we, there is a reason we do not want to compile all the methods, but that will be talked later. And um, by uh, having this compiler architecture, what we can do with, uh, uh, what we can do for optimization are include uh, emitting VM implementation costs, which is like, uh, so usually Ruby VM runs by calculating the stack pointer and the program counter, which is just a virtual thing in the implemented with C code in Ruby VM. But because we can generate a native code, we can remove such kind of interpretation overhead. So technically, by using a JIT compiler, uh, interpreter can be uh, can run as fast as a compiler generated native code. And uh, not, a, not only that, uh, we can also optimize based on what C compiler can know. Like, uh, if we just inline C code to C function definition to uh, generated .c file, compiler can know what they can optimize. For example, uh, if we inline the integer pass definition, uh, there, if there's a, a C code which has the one uh, integer one plus integer two by integer plus method, a uh, compiler can generate integer three by the uh, compiler implemented, implemented uh, optimizations because we use a C compiler to optimize the C core to a native code. 
And third, uh, also we can optimize the VM specific optimizations in uh, implemented manually implemented in the G, comp G compiler. Uh, so usually C compiler can implement very well optimization uh, optimization very well in uh, by uh, compiling the C code to native core, but uh, it's limited to uh, what C compiler can know. And also uh, because we already implemented Ruby VM with the C compiler, some of the things are already optimized in the Ruby VM as well. So if we com just translate the Ruby VM implementation to just a C code for JIT compiler, we do not gain any uh, optimization by just uh, compiling the same functions in Ruby VM. But um, at the same time, if we inline many instructions in the same file, uh, compiler can optimize uh, based on so adjacent instructions uh, concatenate each other because uh, Ruby VM is uh, optimized by C compiler for each instruction. So if we generate m multiple instructions in the same C file, compiler can do many things, but still it's limited to what C compiler can know. So uh, to tell C compiler that Ruby VM has more information which can be used for optimizations, uh, this compiler manually needs to do some VM, Ruby VM specific optimizations. For example, uh, instruction, uh, sorry, ins instance variables are very Ruby VM specific feature. So if we want to optimize Ruby VM uh, instru instruction variables, we need to uh, manually translate Ruby VM instruction, uh, sorry, ins instance variables to some other C native things. And that's the kind of things need to be in the JIT compiler. So we need to uh, implement some optimization in our own layer, not just uh, relying on C compiler. And what we can, can't do with Ruby's JIT is uh, includes optimizing a short running program because uh, JIT compiler optimizes program by using the runtime information. For example, uh, when, we run the, uh, when we run a Ruby method once, we can have a method definition in the inline cache because, because we can't know uh, the definition, method definition of uh, one call spot. If you, even before run uh, before running on once, um, we can't know any information before running only at least once because uh, Ruby is very dynamic. For example, if there's a one plus two, uh, we assume that uh, integer can plus is used in that method, but uh, uh, sometimes that could be recompiled or uh, sorry redefin redefined. So if we it's redefined, we need to. Uh, check if uh, in the actual program process, we need to check if the inline cache is really integer plus or not. And so, uh, because Ruby VMs is already optimized very well, uh, without having such kind of runtime information, we can't optimize well than the virtual machine. So, the reason why JIT compiler generated code is faster than Ruby VM is that we utilize the runtime information. So. Um, if uh, we want to optimize uh, Ruby VM without knowing the actual runtime information to uh, native code, we don't gain uh, a lot of uh, performance again in the native code. So we can't compile the Ruby methods to native code ahead of time efficiently for that reason. So that's why we need to uh, rely on the long running program because we need to run at least once and also uh, JIT compiler takes time for uh, waiting for C compiler. So if we want to compile 100 Ruby methods, we need to wait for some minutes. So uh, it's not suitable for running a program which runs only for uh, milliseconds or seconds. And um, uh, also because of the uh, JIT compiler architecture, which is using C compiler, we can't uh, implement a very highly sophisticated optimization like uh, de-optimizing or which is, uh, I'll be explaining the details of the de-optimization later, but uh, uh, optimization based on the what C compiler generates like uh, native code's uh, address and a stack pointer uh, in the native machine because uh, JIT compiler of the Ruby generates only the C code. So when we generate C code, we can't know the address of the native code generated by C compiler. And we also can't know the address of the stack pointer when we gen just generate a C code. 
So because of that, we are kind of blocked for some implementing some very highly uh, sophisticated optimization, which uh, travel, other implementations like Truffle Ruby implement. But uh, still, uh, we can do a lot of things with this current architecture. So we are currently doing that. And uh, one use case is uh, obviating the micro optimizations. So Ruby's uh, zero question method is uh, slower than uh, ju just doing the equal equal zero because uh, equal equal is a uh, optimized, uh, very optimized. Um, equal equal is a uh, very frequently used instruction or method. So it, which is imp optimized by Ruby VM by ha even having a special instructions for this equal equal method. But on the other hand, a zero question method doesn't have a specialized instruction. So uh, the difference is that uh, equal equal is does not involve a method call because uh, we just check the redefinition of the equal equal method, and if it's not redefined, it just compares that zero and the num. Uh, in the left, left side. But uh, if we need to call that zero question method, because it doesn't have a VM instruction, uh, it, it needs to simply call the Ruby, VM, uh, Ruby method. And it involves a Ruby, call, Ruby method call overhead. So it's lower than uh, equal equal zero. Um, but uh, there is a ticket claiming uh, that zero question is much lower than equal equal zero. And this kind of thing is something which uh, JIT compiler can easily solve because um, if we implement a method inlining in a JIT compiler, uh, we can remove that method call overhead of the zero question method. So by taking a look at this graph, you can see JIT, JIT compiler, which is a green graph it, for zero question method is faster than equal equal zero in a VM. Still, JIT can also optimize equal equal zero, so uh, there's some uh, difference between zero question and equal equal zero for both JIT compiled methods, but uh, still it's n more comparable. Like uh, there was a bigger difference in a VM world, but uh, in JIT compiler, we can at least remove, remove the method call overhead in uh, JIT modes. So at least for uh, hot spots, we can remove such kind of uh, blockers to use zero question method, which is specialized for checking zero uh, in a very happier way. Because uh, if we, if people like to write a zero question method in a hotspot, uh, you, you may be concerned about the performance. But uh, with JIT compiler enabled, you don't need to worry about such kind of things and let JIT compiler handle optimization instead of you. So with that in mind, let's talk about uh, the current status of the Ruby 3. Um, so the current JIT, Ruby JIT's goal is uh, includes uh, optimizing that opt-carrot three times faster. So opt-carrot is a benchmark for measuring Ruby 3 by 3, which is a project to uh, make Ruby 3 faster, three times faster than Ruby 2.0. And uh, opt-carrot is implemented as a NES emulator, which is an emulator, emulator for Famicom games. And um, because it is it written as a pure Ruby and doesn't involve any I/O or uh, memory? A lot of memory access doesn't happen, so uh, opt-carrot is suitable for measuring the pure Ruby VM performance. And other things are include Sinatra and Rails because uh, I prepared a benchmark which is uh, easy to use for measuring the Ruby VM performance, and uh, because it's more closer to uh, actual workload for real real. Uh, real-world usages by uh, production Ruby applications, I also measure Sinatra and Rails benchmarks. And um, it's actually hard to optimize such kind of uh, web applications because sometimes some of the bottlenecks could be just uh, MySQL queries or uh, other I.O. Bounds, bounds or thing, uh, network bound I.O.s. But uh, we want to... Uh, to make JIT useful for real-world applications, I'd like to see at least 10% th throughput increase in the JIT compiler mode because otherwise we can't have a actual big impact by having enabling the JIT compiler. Um, so if we increase a 10% throughput, we could decrease the number of possibly um, 
possibly decrease the number of machines used for running the Ruby application. So in that case, we can decrease the cost by 10%. So um, it's actual, it can show actual usefulness if you uh, increase the throughput by enabling, just enabling the JIT compiler. And uh, for the opt-carrot, uh, currently uh, JIT compiler can optimize the VM by 10, 1.6, times ish for even for uh, 2.6 and 2.7 but in ruby 3 uh, i implemented uh, one optimization which impacts uh, opt a lot so the uh, performance is increased from uh, 83 fps to frame per seconds to uh, 93 frames per second so uh, the greater is better and uh, ruby 3 is much better than ruby 2.7 and other uh, ruby 2.6 uh, on the other hand, uh, Sinatra, and also, I'll talk about that later, but also for Rails, uh, it has some challenges for optimizing the VM's performance. Um, so OptCarrot and Sinatra has, have some differences, and uh, because of that, uh, we are currently struggling to improve the Sinatra by just enabling the JIT compiler. And uh, if we enable JIT compiler, it ended up just slowing down the performance of the virtual, virtual machine because um, I'll talk about that calls later, but this is the current situation. Ruby, in Ruby 2.6, um, you can see that graph, uh, green graph is shrinking from blue graph, which is virtual machine. And Ruby 2.7, it became a little bit better for because of the, uh, what I, can, I implemented in Ruby 2.7, but then Ruby 2.7, uh, 3.0, uh, it improved a lot. Uh, like blue and green graphs are closer now. Uh, still, it's slower, but uh, I had a progress in, in that. And I'll also talk about why it improved, green graph improved like this later. Um, also, for Rails, um, it's still slower than VM. Uh, I think the difference between VM and JIT is became. Uh, smaller in the Ruby 3.0, but uh, sad news is that a virtual machine became a little bit or m much uh, slower in the Ruby 3.0 for other reasons, which is uh, not related to a JIT compiler. But uh, anyway, the, at least the difference between uh, blue graph and green graph uh, is shrinked because of the uh, what I implemented for shrinking the difference between blue and green in for Sinatra in Ruby 3.0 for the same reason. Uh, it improved a lot. But still, I need to do some more work for uh, exceeding the blue graph's performance by the green JIT compiler's performance. So that's the current reality. And what should we do for making the Ruby, uh, JIT compiler performance faster than virtual machine? The, um, uh, I'd like to talk about each of the major Ruby features or JIT functionalities uh, to optimize the overall performance of the Ruby virtual machine. So the, these six things are what I can, I'd like to talk about today. Um, so the first, the first four things are major Ruby features and the other two things are for JIT compiler internals. First thing, um, is uh, variables and constants. Um, you often use local variables instance variables, but you don't usually, or you don't often use global variables, I think. So we are focusing on local variables and instance variables. And instance variables had already had um, a lot of optimizations already. Like uh, the difference between 2.7 and 3.0 for OptiCard's performance improvement was mainly for instance variables because the OptiCard benchmark is very intensive for instance variable accesses. So if we Im implement or improve that instance variable access, the both performance becomes better. So we already implement a lot of effort on the instance, instance variable optimizations. On the other hand, local variables, I had a little uh, benchmark, or sorry, the experiment for changing the Ruby's local variables to C local variables in the C source code generated by Gene compiler. Uh, but uh, it didn't have an uh, impact on the OptiCard benchmark, so I didn't introduce that, but uh, uh, it's already, the experiment is already there, and I think there's a possibility that it can improve performance for other benchmarks like Sinatra Rails, so once I have a chance to try that for other benchmarks and see some improvements, I'll introduce the local variables improvements. 
but global variables are uh, lower uh, lower priorities. And uh, on the other hand, I also I want I'm planning to optimize constants uh, access because uh, in Ruby virtual machine uh, constants are uh, checked or accessed on the uh, runtime basis. But uh, if you know some runtime information by running JIT compiler. Uh, after running methods, uh, we can know what constants are used in a uh, specific place, and we could inline the value after checking if it's not redefined by uh, before accessing that, and that could uh, constant for the actual value if we can inline the actual value. For example, if we set a value to a constant named a, uh, if we write uh, a plus one, uh, we can uh, calculate that uh, one. Uh, one in the a plus uh, one to the uh, results in two beforehand, and we can return two if, by just checking if uh, the constant is redefined or not. And that's that kind of thing is just a minor case, but if it goes to uh, more complicated cases, that could improve more, uh, achieve more optimizations uh, if it's more complex. And uh, that's the plan for the next thing in this area. But still, I haven't written code for constant optimization yet, but uh, uh, that will be uh, near future, at least this year, I think. The next thing is uh, method inlining. So this is very important for JIT compiler optimizations because uh, uh, if we optimize only for a method, uh, we can't know a lot of things. Like if we have implement, optimized uh, JIT compilers, uh, sorry, if, if we optimize Ruby methods uh, used in a single place, uh, it can be... Um, specialized for such single place usage. Like, uh, if we if one method is shared between multiple classes, we can't uh, inline many things for each uh, objects because uh, or classes because uh, a lot of inline caches depend on a single class. And if we if a method is shared across multiple methods, we can't be uh, just cache as same thing for one specific class. So if we method inline some things uh, in a cold spot, uh, we can fix the type information for a single cold place. And also, we can possibly eliminate the method call overhead. And because Ruby's method call is complicated and uh, dynamic, uh, sometimes method call overhead is big. And by eliminating the method call overhead is kind of important for uh, optimizing the Ruby program. And also, um, if we inline a lot of things in a single place, um, C compiler can know a, a lot of things to optimize Ruby code. So instead of uh, compiling each, each method one by one, uh, if we can inline a lot of things in a single method, we can uh, combine this information for optimizing the uh, overall uh, method uh, behaviors. And uh, current progress for this is uh, Ruby, inlining Ruby method is already implemented in uh, Ruby 2.7, but uh, in Ruby 2.7, that was uh, limited to some uh, very simple methods, and we are currently uh, improving the situation for uh, uh, supporting more kinds of methods. And also, uh, in Ruby 2.3, uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Ruby 3.0, uh, I supported C method inlining by, uh, by, me by mechanism I'll talk about that later. Um, anyway, uh, so there's there's uh, two types of methods in the Ruby. Uh, one is Ruby and the other is C, and both are already uh, implemented to be inline. So uh, the the thing I need the what we need or also need to do is to sub, uh, exploiting this mechanism to various methods because <clears throat> we already implemented a way to inline those methods, but uh, some of them are not applied to existing methods well, so we need to make sure this mechanism can be applied to other methods so that we can uh, optimize a lot of or act all the hotspots we can uh, see. And the other vector is super and yield. So uh, super and yield are different from actual uh, normal Ruby method code. Uh, sorry normal method calls, and it could uh, dispatch to Ruby method or C method, and uh, normal methods, method calls are already uh, inlineable, but still super and yield are not supported yet. But in Ruby 3.0, we had some progress for 
or we prepared some prerequisites for inlining super and EO, so uh, we'll be able to uh, implement these inlining later. And once in, we can, uh, once we implement these inlinings, all of them, um, we'll be able to uh, unblock many optimization over uh, method boundaries, which is usually hard for virtual machine because uh, virtual machine needs to uh, dispatch actual Ruby method because uh, Ruby method interpretation depends on the program counter, which is uh, pointing to the bytecode, which is very VM specific thing. And uh, this kind of thing can be removed in the JIT compiler's native code. So uh, that's more easier in the JIT compiler world. The next thing is a uh, constant folding. Uh, once we enable uh, things in the method inlining, we can uh, optimize away some calculations by if uh, the values are known to C compiler or JIT compiler. For example, uh, when we write a uh, one plus one, as I said before, that could be uh, folded to just two, and we can just return two by uh, checking if integer plus is redefined. And that kind of thing is called constant folding, and uh, that is already possible for VM of instructions like integer plus, but the uh, important thing is uh, we also need to support constant folding for various methods so that we can optimize various methods. And C methods like uh, kernel class is one example which wasn't uh, optimized by VM instructions. And in that case, we can't uh, constant fold uh, uh, such C methods not optimized by uh, or implemented by VM optimized instructions. So uh, for doing that, we need to uh, for the values in the JIT compiler level instead of uh, just letting C compiler for that kind of constants. So we are, um, this kind of thing is very important for uh, getting the uh, ideal performance by JIT compiler. So um, enabling the constant folding for C method is kind of one of the priorities I have right now. And uh, there's some progress for that. And I already had a, uh, proof of a concept for uh, calculating the result of method call beforehand in the compile time instead of runtime, and that makes a lot of uh, optimizations in the JIT compiler. The fourth thing is uh, object allocation. So usually, uh, when we run the Ruby VM, we just create a object on heap every time. But uh, some things are not need to be. Uh, generated every time. For example, if we, sometimes you may add a dot freeze to string, string retail, and in that case, string retail does not generate any new object on that retail because of the uh, frozen string retail introduced in Ruby 2.3. But uh, that kind of uh, micro optimization is uh, troublesome or may bother you when you write a Ruby code, and it's not good for Ruby programs ha programmers' happiness. So uh, if we can, if JIT compiler can detect that uh, string retail is not used elsewhere or copy, not copied to elsewhere, we can automatically add dot trees to such string retail and that can be allocated beforehand. And I call that as a static allocation. Static, not stack, which is uh, written above. But uh, So static allocation is one idea I want to implement very soon, but uh, still there's no code yet. But um, uh, Ruby 2. Point, uh, on the other hand, uh, it also means that Ruby 3.0 has some more rooms to improve more uh, performance. And uh, at least I prepared some preparation for achieving that. For uh, one thing is uh, annotating method definitions uh, because uh, for analyzing uh, Ruby string is safe to be uh, frozen or uh, allocated beforehand, we need to be sure that some methods taking that string object is not escaping that to other world like global variables. So if we uh, escape a Ruby string to a global variable, we would need to uh, actually allocate that to uh, avoid causing a troubles. But if we <clears throat> be sure, if we can be sure like uh, equal equal method doesn't escape a, a argument to other place, we can just allocate a string reader beforehand. And that can 
that kind of allocation or uh, that kind of analysis is also important for stack allocation, which is uh, faster than allocating on stack. So stack is uh, stack can be stack allocation can be uh, made by just bumping the stack pointer and just uh, decreasing the stack pointer later uh, once we stop using that. So heap is um, f slower than stack allocation because we need to manage. Uh, out of heap pages, our uh, markup is slower than uh, stack allocation because uh, it's not uh, stack allocation is just bumping and decreasing the stack pointer, but uh, heap is a more complicated access pattern. There's a more complicated access pattern, so um, that's slower. And we, uh, if we can, we want to uh, use stack allocation rather than uh, heap allocation for uh, better object allocation performance. The, the other thing is a uh, technique called de-optimization. So usually we want to optimize uh, programs, but sometimes we want to de-optimize the uh, Ruby programs because uh, we need to optimize the Ruby code based on some assumptions like integer plus is not redefined. And once it's de redefined, we need to uh, de-optimize the uh, native code, which is relying on that integer pass is not redefined and uh, we if we redefine uh, we if we have a mechanism to de-optimize the ruby program like that um, we can uh, implement that kind of uh, optimization which have some assumption like that and um, but uh, if we implement the optimization checkpoints um, the it also has a overhead for checking that like uh, we don't want to of course we don't want to check if uh, integer pass is redefined in a single uh, every line and um, for decreasing that kind of overhead we'd like to reduce the number of places checking that kind of things and uh, that was already implemented in the Ruby 2.6 I think and uh, in Ruby 2.7 we also imp improved that technique by uh, introducing more attributes to uh, say make sure the each BM instruction is safe for uh, removing the safe points or not. And other thing is zero cost deoptimization, which is uh, related to the uh, C compiler uh, limitation. Like, um, if we want to uh, remove the check in the native code, uh, we could uh, remove the or replace the native code from the uh, JIT compiled code to a virtual machine interpretation uh, frame by uh, dealing with the native stack from the uh, place which causes the deoptimization. Like when we redefine the integer plus, uh, the method definition have, may have, uh, could have a hook to deoptimize the native core to a, a virtual machine interpretation frame. And that kind of thing requires some knowledge on the native code. So uh, that's what I said before, like uh, zero code, um, knowing that Instruction, native instruction pointer and native stack pointer is required for implementing the zero cost deoptimization. So it's currently blocked by the current JIT compiler architecture. But uh, I think that's not currently not super important. Like we can implement other major uh, high impact optimizations first. And then uh, if we think zero cost deoptimization is more important uh, than adding some more optimizations, we could switch the uh, JIT compiler architecture from C compiler to other uh, native way, like L using LLVM or whatever uh, JIT compiler frameworks or uh, some beauty in something. The last thing is uh, scalability. So um, current JIT compiler is somewhat not scalable because of the uh, memory limitation. For example, uh, if we compile a lot of Ruby methods to native code, uh, C CPU needs to cache a lot of machine code in the CPU cache and because the CPU machine cache size is limited to some kilobytes in the level 1 and uh, even for last level cache it's not super big so we need to make sure JIT compiled methods are not uh, big and um, but compared to other normal JIT compilers uh, in the world uh, Ruby's native code is somewhat bigger than uh, usual JIT compiled native code and so uh, the more we compile Ruby methods, the more it becomes slower because of the uh, CPU cache performance. And that's one thing. And the other two things are 
uh, reducing the code size uh, because the even if even if we compile many methods because uh, each of the method is smaller we could say the overall code size is smaller and cache will be more efficient so code size reduction is more important and I, I did that in Ruby 2.0 uh, and one, uh, that will be talked later and uh, the last thing is a JIT dispatch cost so uh, calling a JIT method is kind of complicated because uh, we need to check if uh, one method is JIT compiled or not and if it's JIT compiled we call the uh, JIT native code and uh, that kind of mechanism takes some time than just dispatching the VM instruction for uh, just calling the Ruby methods currently. So uh, calling the Ruby, uh, JIT, JIT native code is slower than uh, calling the Ruby method from a VM. So uh, if we call a JIT code from JIT code, that becomes actually faster. But uh, uh, if all of the methods are not compiled, uh, sometimes Ruby, uh, we need to call uh, JIT code from Ruby virtual machine frames, so the, that kind of slowdown happens. So if we, if the uh, calling a Ruby method is uh, slow, how faster than uh, calling a native code, uh, just the more we compile Ruby methods, the, again, that becomes more uh, slower um, by the dispatch cost. So that was a scarcity issue, but uh, uh, we are imp improving the situation for them. And the next thing is uh, recent progress in Ruby 3. So as I said before, the CPU cache is important for improving the scalability. And uh, iCache, which, uh, which stands for instruction cache, is uh, one thing we need to improve. So, um, so CPU has uh, multiple level of caches. And the first level, L1, has an instruction-specific instruction cache. And uh, if we have a lot of native code, uh, the cache miss happens more often than uh, the virtual machine. And one example is that um, in Opscout benchmark, the, this is a result of the region provider for the Intel CPUs. And uh, you don't need to understand how to uh, interpret this graph, but uh, green parts shows that uh, instructions are executed efficiently. And red parts, memory bound or gray part, front end bound, are showing that uh, they, these uh, ratio are not executed very uh, efficiently. So um, you, if you look at the left side, uh, you can see iCache misses 0.0%. .0%. So when we execute OptiCout on the virtual machine, uh, you don't see any iCache misses because uh, our native code is shared across multiple instruction, virtual machine instructions, and we do not generate any native code in addition to Ruby virtual machine instructions. And so um, it's efficient. And CPU uh, spends 63% of the time for uh, purely running the CPU instructions. On the other hand, when we enable JIT compiler, uh, native code uh, is generated, and we see 2.7% cache misses. And front-end bound increases for uh, other reasons, but uh, uh, we'll see other instances in later. But uh, uh, still, front-end bound, uh, red, red part is not super big. And uh, actually, memory bound is uh, shrinked in the uh, JIT mode because uh, uh, or oh, sorry, JIT compiler performs uh, memory optimizations in the native code. So uh, but trade-offs between memory bound and uh, front-end bound for uh, other branch receivers and DSB switches in the left side pay the uh, overhead of the of front-end bound well. So the trade-off is working well. And still, green graph is not super big. And even if we reduce the green part from 63 to uh, 53.5, uh, the overall number of instructions are decreased. If you look at the uh, instruction retired, like 31 billions to uh, 14 billions in this uh, graph. But the problem is when we execute Sinatra, uh, a lot of other things are causing the bottlenecks. Like the green part is only 23%. So uh, most of the time, uh, CPU is not doing the useful work and uh, just spending time in the front end bound, like including the iCache misses. So this is uh, actually a virtual machine version but you see the iCache misses already is already 10.54%. Uh, 
uh, compared to Opticat 0%. And so uh, in Sinatra, it's already, uh, uh, I guess, misses bound, bound sometimes. And uh, it's GT enabled, it's more severe situation. Like, I guess, it misses increased to 19.2%. Uh, so it's more worse. Like, um, this is the current situation for Ruby 3.0. So uh, if we enable JIT compiler, uh, Ruby uh, virtual machine spends more time for uh, missing iCache and fetching the actual instructions from memory. And so it's slower than fetching it from iCache. So uh, because of the, how CPU behaves, uh, it becomes slower. And um, that's the reason uh, currently uh, Sinatra and VLS become slower by enabling JIT compiler. So, I'm trying to improve the situation. So to decrease iCache misses, uh, what I implemented in Ruby 2.3 was uh, one thing is deduplication of the same core. So if we compile one method, uh, um, Ruby methods one by one, uh, Ruby, the current architecture generates a SO file for each Ruby method. And finally, uh, because the generating the shared object one by one is uh, has an issue for sharing the code across multiple methods. Uh, we combine the uh, SO file to a single SO file uh, in, even in uh, Ruby 2.6 and Ruby 2.7, and that contributes to uh, reducing the page faults. But uh, uh, in Ruby 3.0, I also implemented uh, the improved the com combining SO file to a single file by uh, changing the architecture like the current architecture is um, combining .o file. So the, when we compile JIT, comp, uh, JIT compile Ruby method, it leaves a .o file, uh, which is between .c file and .so file. And .o file is combined to .single .so file when, once the old JIT compilation is finished. And um, in Ruby 2.6, uh, sorry, Ruby 3.0, uh, on the other hand, uh, it just leaves a .c file in the slash temp directory, and uh, once all methods are compiled for the, to .so file, we compile .c file from the beginning to .single .so file later, so that we can deduplicate the same code by the same compiler. So that's how I implemented the uh, deduplication. And the other technique is to uh, partition hot and cold methods by uh, annotating the C functions by code attribute in the C compiler. And by doing so, uh, we can separate uh, hot paths of the C functions and code paths of the C functions, and that will uh, improve the locality of the C code. And by doing so, uh, CPU can, uh, CPU is efficient at caching the adjacent code. So if we uh, partition hot paths in a very close place, uh, CPU can uh, behave more efficiently. And uh, the dedication was improving the code size like from 1.3 megabytes to uh, 260 kilobytes. So it decreases a, a lot of size and it was the uh, way to improve the Sinatra a lot. Like uh, it is 12,129 RPS to uh, 12,818 uh, RPS. So that's uh, more uh, throughput and that's what's important for Sinatra performance. And I think that contributes to Rails as well. So that was uh, one thing, the recent progress. But uh, the other thing is uh, merging type checks on Ivor access. Ivor stands for instance instance variable. And uh, instance variable access is important for optimizing the optical benchmark. And uh, Ruby objects is uh, categorized to two things. Like one is a uh, R object has with the embed, embed, embed frag false, and the other is a embed frag true. So if embed frag is false, we don't embed uh, instance variable values in the Ruby object. Like uh, Ruby object, R object has a, a number of instance, instance variables and instance variable pointer to heap and instance variable index table cache. And uh, we need to check the instance variable pointer IVPTR in the heap uh, when we need to look up the instance variable, ah, sorry, instance variable. But on the other hand, uh, in a uh, embed frag is true, uh, we have the instance, var uh, instance variable in the R object uh, up to three things. And uh, 
we can uh, just look up the object itself uh, when we need to access instance, uh, instance variables. But uh, when we run the virtual machine, we need to check the flag every time. And uh, branch, the way to check the or look up the instance, instance variable. But in a JIT compiler, we can check, uh, we can know or assume uh, our object is uh, embed true or false, and we can generate a code specialized for each flag, and also we can uh, inline the in index to the array or the IVPTR heap because the uh, virtual machine has an instruction cat which with the index to the instruction uh, instance variable, and so. Uh, that's why uh, JIT compiler can behave better. And in the Ruby 3.0, uh, such kind of checks needed for accessing instance, instance variable is merged to a single check in, in the beginning of the Ruby method. So if there's a multiple uh, instance, instance variable accesses in the method, uh, the checks will be faster because we check that only once. And because of that, Ruby OptiCAD uh, performance became better by, like this. And uh, then the final thing is uh, uh, inlining the C method call. So as I said before, Ruby 3.0 started to support inlining C method. And that was that had been hard because of the difficulty to detecting whether it's safe to omit a call frame or not in for each specific C method. For example, um, if C method can call an arbitrary method, we can inline the C method because we can uh, guarantee that it's safe to remove the uh, method call frame or not. And so uh, we introduced a way to define or way to efficiently call a C method from a Ruby defined method. And so we started to replace the uh, C based method definition by Ruby based method definition like this. So this is uh, uh, one example uh, of the uh, C core feature called between method. So in Ruby 3.7, we introduced a way to define methods like this in the C Ruby core, which you can't use. Uh, but uh, so that this kind of primitive dot IO with number is called in C function directly instead of uh, dispatching the method from the primitive constant. So this is actually not a Ruby constant, but a Ruby specific Ruby core specific internal way to call a C function. And by doing this, uh, we can also annotate the C function like primitive ATTR. Uh, uh, exclamation mark, and we can say the RB object class C method call is safe to inline. And now we can uh, check if this uh, C function is safe to be inlined or not on the CI or test by uh, assertion enabled only for the uh, test. And uh, by for doing that, we can uh, annotate this kind of inline annotation safely, and JIT compiler can. Uh, inline that kind of seek functions based method uh, if it's compiled or replaced to this kind of built-in methods. And now kernel.class method is implemented, implemented with built-in method and um, we can inline this uh, kernel class. And by inlining kernel class, uh, we achieve the performance improvement in a G-compiler like the center Graph is about the JIT compiler, but uh, that was not enabling um, method inlining. And by enabling the method JIT, uh, method inlining with JIT, the, that becomes from uh, 1.3 times faster to uh, 1.7 times faster. And another example or benefit is that if we inline the C definition of the .avs method call, uh, we can calculate the method call result beforehand. Like minus one .avs should be always. Uh, one, just a fixed num or uh, integer one, but uh, uh, in the native core, integer object one is in the uh, zero x three, is, which is uh, actually three. But um, uh, like this, uh, JIT compiler can generate a native code uh, result of the method code beforehand. The current challenges for uh, these areas are include uh, allowing exceptions or exception on inline methods. So if we annotate inline methods, uh, we need to be sure that uh, eliminating the method call frame is safe, and uh, it's not safe if we uh, if um, C based method raises a exception because uh, uh, if we raise a exception, uh, we need to include a frame in the backtrace. So uh, any method which may raise a error uh, is not safe for inline for now. So some 
such kind of exceptions include type error, which usually happens for any method which takes arguments. So you, currently, it's hard to uh, inline methods which take arguments. It's very <laughs> bad thing. And the other thing is no memory error. So if um, a method allocates any object, that may cause no method error, mem no memory error. So uh, any method allocating object is currently not subject to inlining. So uh, method like string to s is also sometimes allocates objects if the receiver is not string. So um, to s is currently not inlineable. That's also another problem for uh, unblocking such optimization. So I'd like to uh, lazily update the frame call frame uh, once the exception happens, and by that way I'd, I'd like to I'm planning to emit the uh, or make it possible to inline such methods. Uh, another thing is optimizing the virtual machine, uh, sorry, JIT compiler method, a JIT compiled method called from virtual machine, which is uh, mentioned before. Um, so JIT, JIT based code is slower than uh, virtual machine based Ruby method. And if we co JIT compile the method just returning nil, it just becomes slower if the caller is virtual machine. And uh, nil is just something not optimizable and we can't have any guarantee. Uh, JIT performance benefit in the JIT compiler, but uh, because of this JIT, JIT, JIT just-in-time compiler method overhead, uh, sorry, native call overhead, um, currently it becomes slower. So this is a problem uh, when we, especially when we um, compile a lot of methods. So this graph is showing the JIT compiler, uh, JIT, com JIT based net method call is slower than real virtual machine based call especially when we compile a lot of methods like 100 and uh, red graph grows larger than gray graph later and so virtual machine call is more scalable than JIT compiled method call and uh, this is one thing I wanted to uh, improve in Ruby 2.7 but uh, actually um, I didn't uh, make it in the Ruby 2.7 so I'd like to revisit this problem in Ruby 3.0 to make this better and uh, at least I have some patch to for POC, but this, it has some problems in the corner cases, so I'm improving that right now. And the uh, last thing is uh, improving the inline decision because uh, Rails has this kind of code, like uh, concurrent map is shared by uh, actual concurrent map and other subclass like uh, action view, resolver cache, small cache. So if um, one single method is shared by multiple classes like this by inheritance, uh, it's sometimes hard for virtual machine to uh, use the same inline cache because inline cache is specialized for a single class. And if we inline uh, such kind of method call by the caller, uh, we can be sure that one caller, caller spot is uh, specialized for a small cache or map. And in that case, we can we uh, utilize or specialize the uh, inline cache for a single class, and we don't need to uh, de-optimize that for other classes. And uh, as said in the roadmap, there are more things to be improved in the roadmap, and that's one thing to be revisit later. So in summary, uh, we reviewed Ruby 3 JIT roadmap and what already we've already implemented. And while it's not useful for Rails or Sinatra yet, We've had progress towards that and in Ruby 3.0, and um, the Ruby 3.0 development is still not finished, and um, we may see some pro more progress in the uh, Ruby 3.0 release, and um, we, as we continue to develop JIT compiler, we'll see more optimizations for uh, Rails or Sinatra or real world applications later. So that's it. Thank you for listening.